Okay, good afternoon and thank you very much to Apex SA for asking me to present to you today and Marcel for the introduction. I have to apologize for my light in this room, it's pretty bad, but I am hiding from my children. Um, I hope I can get through the next 20 minutes without being found and climbed on. Uh, Verena touched on the difficulties of doing uh, stuff like this from home. Um, so yeah, this is a great event and it's so lovely to see all these familiar faces of friends, especially in this time. As Marcel said, my name is Anne Treasure and I'm a data curator for SEON, which is the South African Environmental Observation Network. Um, my background is predominantly research, both terrestrial and marine, on the subantarctic islands and oceans. Um, but today I'm going to try and convince you how crucial it is that you manage your data properly. Um, so normally when I mention something like data management or metadata to a room of people, I normally get met with expressions like this. And let's not mention the normal reaction when trying to get people to upload to an online data repository. Um, but let me just start out by saying that good data management really is essential, particularly in the age of open data and scientific accountability. Um, however, scientists really receive formal training in data management. Um, I can't teach you best practice in the next 20 minutes, but my goals today are to convince you that data management really is worthwhile. And when I say worthwhile, I mean essential. Um, and to introduce you to what is known as the data life cycle um, and to hopefully demystify data management to make you realize that it's really not that hard to do. So we can start off by asking the question, so why should we manage our research data? Um, well, firstly, we have what has become known as the data explosion, where we now have a situation where as technology advances, more and more data are being created and collected. Um, so the issue is not so much about creating the data, but being able to navigate and use the data. So good data management really is critical to ensure that data are well organized, understandable and reusable. Um, one of the main reasons to manage your, your data properly is the threat of data loss. And this threat is very real. And I, I really cannot stress this enough. Data can be lost due to disasters or failures of, um, for example, hardware or software. Also the format of the data might become obsolete in the future. So the data would therefore be unusable. There can be human errors or attacks or theft. Um, recently, I read about a department in one of our South African universities that lost decades of data and research due to computers and hard drives being stolen during a break-in. Um, we've also had crucial data being lost when computers or hard drives were stolen out of cars, um, and the list goes on. Um, so this is um, Michener et al. put together this data decay curve, showing how the usability of data decreases with time. Um, and these, for reasons um, including improper details, for example, having been recorded about the data, retirement or career change of scientists or death of the investigator. Um, and I'll let you read through the specifics in your own time after the workshop. And I can, I can send this presentation around um, after today if there's a way of doing that. Um, so there are good reasons to manage your data, and this includes for yourself, um, to keep yourself focused and organized, and this therefore makes your research much easier. Um, also, in case you need the data later, you can also get credit for producing the data, and these days you often need to manage your data to meet funder or institution or journal requirements. Um, then there are things to consider, like the persistency of data through time, uh, to facilitate data sharing, which important, importantly maximizes the potential for collaborations as well as citations of your data um, and you need to be able to reproduce your data as well. So this is what is known as the research data life cycle. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, there's no time for that, you can read it later, um, but it basically shows the stages of research data and for each stage there are best practices and tools to help you and there is of course overlap between the stages. So basically these stages include planning your research, collecting or creating your data, processing and analyzing your data, documenting and using your data, preserving and sharing, and then around to reusing your data. So I'm not going to go through it in detail. I'm just going to touch on a few important aspects with regards to data management in each of these stages and be aware, as I said, that there is some overlap between the stages. So firstly, you need to plan your research. And for data, you should put something together called a data management plan, which you may or may not have heard of, um, or a DMP. 
These are often submitted as part of grant applications, but they are indeed very useful whenever you are creating data. Um, so the DNP, it's a brief plan that outlines the practices for collecting, organizing, storing and backing up of your data, as well as any processing needs that you may have. Um, it also allows you to critically review your project and to develop a suitable plan of action in case you come across any issues that you need to overcome. Um, these days, particularly a DMP is often required by a funding body or an institution or by publishers. And for group projects, for example, a DMP can help to delegate responsibilities. As I've already said, it helps to keep you organized and therefore keeps your research easier. And it also enables future reuse of your data. So where can you find a DMP template? Um, often funders or universities will specify which template to use. Otherwise, you can find tools and templates online. For example, this one is from the UK's uh, Digital Curation Center. Remember that good data management is a reflective process and it's important to be flexible and to allow for changes and additions as your project evolves. So keep your plan as a living document, which is continuously re revisited and adapted if necessary. So after planning your research and what will happen to your data, you then move on to collecting or creating your data. And for this, we have three main aspects here. We've got data capture, data storage and versioning. The data capture refers to how the data is collected. So be this observational or experimental uh, simulation or derived. Uh, the second aspect to be aware of is data storage. And for this, you need to know what data types and formats to use, ideally prioritized to what is most common to your field of research. And it's important to use open formats wherever possible to ensure longevity of your data and to make it easier to share. Um, if you have physical samples, you need to ask yourself questions, for example, are they required as part of your permit or ethics clearance? What is the best preservation method for your samples? And who can house them long term in a standardized way? Um, know where you can store and back up, back up your data, and we'll get to this in a minute. For versioning, this is important to keep track of, for example, to be able to run analyses on a specific version of your data. Um, as a golden rule, and I cannot stress this enough, is always keep your raw data. Um, and to have an accurate and descriptive way to maintain data versions. Um, a good idea for this is, for example, to maintain a document that describes in detail the processing between each one of your data versions. Some extra pointers I can give you for creating your data include, for those of you using spreadsheets, collect what is known as tidy data. Um, most of us enter data into spreadsheets for humans, not for computers, but for efficiency and take, making it easy for a computer to work with the data, particularly if you're importing this into a coding program, it's advisable to adhere to the principles of what is known as tidy data. Um, this will also make your data more understandable and therefore ensures ease of, ease of use of your data by others and of course by yourself um, and therefore enhances data sharing and by this, as I've said already, uh, more potential collaborations or citations of your data. Um, it therefore also helps with the longevity of your data and generally is just good practice. So have a look at the work by Hadley Wickham on the subject as well as the teachings of data carpentry. Um, as a quick example, if you look at this spreadsheet, um, and then this one. And if you compare these two, for example, to this one over here, this is just a simple version of, sorry, a simple example of converting your messy data to tidy data. Uh, and I don't have time to go into this in detail, but again, if you do read up on the principles of tidy data and data carpentry, and the advice that is given on things like variable names and symbols, how to optimally organize your data in spreadsheets, how to deal with dates and time, for example, which are notoriously a pain. So if we get back to this slide, um, I would also recommend including some method of quality assurance and quality control to your data creation. And don't forget to back up your data and to use version control. Um, another tip is to use controlled vocabularies based on metadata standards, which we will get to in a minute. Um, a controlled vocabulary is basically, it's just a vocabulary of set terms for a specific variable. So for example, the names of regions or oceans, if you use the terms from a controlled vocabulary, your data will be more findable and accessible to others. Um, so in short, make your data clear and easy to understand and easy to use and create well-organized and sustainable data. 
and again, I cannot stress this enough, back up, back up, back up your data. Um, there are a lot of places where you can store your data. You're best to use managed services where possible as they're more resilient. Um, if you do store data on standalone computers or memory sticks or in the cloud, just be mindful of the risk of loss or security breaches. Um, if you're responsible for backing up your own data, you want to ensure that you have multiple copies on different media with at least one off-site. Um, remember that backup and preservation are not the same thing. Preservation is about archiving your data for the long term. And I'm not going to show this video to you today, we don't have the time, but for those Toy Story fans out there, this is a real life story of poor data management and how we almost lost the whole of the movie Toy Story 2. So I do implore you to watch that. Um, we briefly move on to processing data and I'm not going to spend much, much time on this. This is not a course on processing or analytics, um, but just to briefly at least outline a few pointers uh, to ensure that you keep track of your analyses. So as I've already said, most importantly, never ever modify your raw original data. Always make a copy before you make any changes and create a new file with your cleaned up or analyzed data. Um, when you are cleaning your data or analyzing your data, it's very easy to end up with a spreadsheet, for example, that looks very different to the one that you started with. So in order to be able to reproduce your analyses or to figure out what you did when, for example, your supervisor or a reviewer asks for a different analysis, do not modify the original data set or you will never know where you started and keep track of the steps you took in your cleanup um, or your analysis and the code that you used to do this. Um, you could, for example, do this in a plain text file stored in the same folder as the data file and also comment, add comments to your code so that you will know what you did. Um, you think you're going to remember in the future what you did, but trust me, you likely won't. Um, export your clean data to text-based formats, for example, CSV, if that's applicable to your field of research or to a non-proprietary format. This ensures that anyone can use the data and therefore promotes data longevity and is also required by most repositories. Also data and code files as well as folders should be clearly named and well organized so that you can find them, for example, in the future. So next in our data life cycle is documenting data. A crucial part of ensuring that research data can be used and shared and reused is by taking care that those data are accessible, understandable and usable. Um, and for this, you need to ensure that you have clear descriptions of your data and how the data were created, what the data means, what their content and structure are and any manipulations that may have taken place to your data set. And creating comprehensive documentation about your data like this is easiest when you begin at the beginning of your project and continue throughout your research. But if you haven't done this already, don't worry. Um, it's just, it's never too late to start doing this. So a buzzword in the data field is FAIR and data should be made open and FAIR as far as possible. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So for example, can others find your data easily? Is your data accessible and retrievable? Is your data interoperable? For example, have you made use of controlled vocabularies like I mentioned before? Um, is your data reusable? So for example, does it meet community standards? I put a slide at the end as extra information for you to look at afterwards explaining this a bit better. Um, this slide just gives an explanation of a good and bad fair data. Good, for example, being open data archived in an online repository with open access, meaning that anyone can access it. Um, and it has excellent metadata describing the data. And bad fair data, for example, being data stored as a single copy on printed paper, stuck in a filing cabinet in a basement under a leaking, leaking pipe, for example. So please do not do that. Um, this brings us to metadata, which is a crucial term in data management. Metadata is data about data, and this is information that is needed to be able to locate and understand and reuse your research data. Again, I cannot stress enough the importance of putting together good metadata. This is not just for reuse in the future by others um, or for making it easier for you to upload to a repository when you get there. Um, it's to make things easier for you at the time of doing your research. You think you're going to remember everything you did and what everything means, but given enough time, trust me, you likely won't. Um, for example, I was in a situation where I wanted to publish on work I'd done 10 years previously in my PhD 
and without having put together decent metadata for myself explaining what was what and what the variables were and what I'd done and what analyses I'd done and how I'd done them, I spent many agonizing hours trying to remember what I had done and what my code meant and what the variables meant. So please take it from me, put together good metadata from the start. It really will make your life much, much easier. Um, if you can, use set metadata standards from your field of research to enable interoperability. And again, I've put some more information of this at the end. Um, for example, biologists could use one called Darwin Core. If you do upload your data to a repository, they will specify the standard for you to use. Um, there are also different license conditions for data access that you need to be aware of, but do try and make your data open if you can when uploading to a repository. Um, there are different categories of metadata, and I'm not going to read this whole slide, but there's metadata for the WHO, for example, and this is what you need for citing that data. There is discovery metadata, including the where and the when of your data, and reusability metadata, which is the how, what, and why of your data. So here is an, an example of including metadata and data descriptions from the start of your research. These are spreadsheets from Dr. Jasper Slingsby, who is a scientist at SEON. He has tabs for project metadata, giving detailed descriptions of how the data was collected, dates, who owns the data, who collected it, descriptions of the various spreadsheets in the file, et cetera. Um, and you can see in there a spreadsheet, for example, called metadata fields, where he starts to align the variables that he uses to a metadata standard relative, relevant to his field. And he starts to give descriptions of his variables, which he continues to add to as he continues with his study. Um, this metadata information is included in the same file as the data. Um, and so this ensures that he can always keep track of what he has done and what he is doing and what his data means. Finally, we move on to preserving and sharing your data. And I'm not gonna cover reusing your data because uh, much of what I've said today applies to being able to re reuse your data anyway. Um, so how can you share and preserve your data for future use? Well, you could publish a paper as um, Val and a very very nicely I've, um, set that out for you. And with this, you can publish and archive your data as well as your code to ensure reproducibility. Uh, where can you publish your data? Well, there are data journals and of course data repositories. These repositories are often suggested by a publisher or a funder or ask your supervisor. Uh, your university may have one. Uh, you could also use a data center or a repository specific to your discipline. Just be sure that you do preserve your data in a repository that complies with international standards to maximize interoperability of your data. For the polar sciences, the SCAR website has some information on data and databases. SCAR promotes free and unrestricted access to Antarctic data and information by promoting open and accessible archiving practices. And indeed, this is outlined in the, in the Antarctic Treaty. SCAR has a standing committee on Antarctic data management known as SCADM. And SCADM coordinates the Antarctic data management system, which is composed of the Antarctic Master Directory and national Antarctic data centers of individual countries. The Antarctic Master Directory is basically just a directory of data descriptions. It's not a central database containing the actual data. Um, I think we do have a mix of countries represented here today. Some of your countries will have a national Antarctic data center. For South Africa, we will potentially have a National Antarctic Data Center in the future if the currently proposed polar research infrastructure is funded. So in summary, if your data are well organized, documented, preserved, accessible and verified, the result is high quality data that is easy to share and reuse in science. And this gives citations and credibility to you as the researcher. Uh, we also get big cost savings to science, um, as well as better science, with scientists having access to much more data than they would be able to collect themselves. Um, I've also included some references here for you, um, as well as some extra information. There's, this is hot off the press. This article was in Nature Biomedical Engineering this week. Um, yeah. So you're also welcome to contact me for admi advice. My email address was on the title slide and um, yeah, Liesl, I'm not sure if there's a way I can send this um, presentation out so people have the information. Um, but yeah, I thank you for listening and I hope that I have convinced you to all furiously start managing your data. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was um, 
very detailed and um, insightful, I'll say that. Um, we even had a comment to say that they wish that some professors, professors would stick to the tidy data plan that you proposed. Um, and I, you know, I can also say like, you know, that the whole data management plan is such a great idea. And I found, you know, only later on do you figure out that, hey, you know, I actually should have done something about my data because now it's all very confusing and missing in, in someone's flash drive in their car that they sold last year or something. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we plan to make all these, or all the presentations that are willing to be shared, make them available and we'll contact you after afterwards about that. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, and for everyone else, I think, you know, the Google Doc link, there is space there to add questions and Anne can address those questions offline at a later stage.